I listened with interest to Tim Lang's talk yesterday. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I think everything he said was absolutely um, key. And with one exception, and I'd like to hope that the one exception is, is what I would like to pick up today. He said that we need to rethink our romance with upland sheep farming. And maybe we do. And But I think my message today is that we mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's more we need to support upland farming to transform itself, to provide us with the new needs for Wales going forwards. Um, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we bring the farming community with us rather than push them away from us. And I have to say that this hasn't always worked very well in Cumbria. Uh, and I'll pick up a couple of examples as we go through today. Having said that, um, what I'd really like to talk to you about today is uh, within the context of up and farming is to talk about the idea of marginality. Um, it's a complicated subject. I'll, I'll try and get to the nub a bit as fast as I can. Um, and we need to turn this view that upland farming is marginal on its head. And we need to recognise the huge opportunity that upland farming systems can actually can actually play and must provide going forwards. Uh, and my message, I suppose, is, is to ignore farmers at your peril. And uh, this chap, I think, says it all, the Lorax. It's not Peppa Pig, sorry, but it's the Lorax for today. And for those of you that don't know very much about the Lorax, uh, it was a book by Dr. Zeus for children. And the idea was, is that uh, uh, in an imaginary country, uh, a creature turned up and started chopping down all these trees. The Lorax said, please don't do it. But the creature continued to chop them down and use up the resources. And then eventually there were no trees left and the entire landscape was decimated. And I think really there is a, there's a massively apocryphal tale in there in relation to how we think about upland farming and not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So drawing on my knowledge of Cumbria, just to give you an idea, this I think is a very classic landscape that people think about when they think about Cumbria, they think about the Lake District, the classic upland fells and the valley bottoms. However, I think the important message to remember is that all upland landscapes are very different from each other. So just within Cumbria, we have a range of upland environments. We have what's known as the debatable lands, which was the land between Scotland and England that constantly changed plans over the past. We have the South and Southern Lake District, which looks very different, as you can see, from the Northern Lake District. We have the Yorkshire Dales out to the east, which obviously now with the extension of the, the National Park, um, of both the Lake District and the Yorkshire Dales, they now kiss each other near the M6 corridor. And then we also have the North Pennines up in the northeast of Cumbria. And you can see from this range of landscapes that upland farming is not one thing fits all. It's very, very different. I'm sure you can draw parallels within Wales about how the different landscapes slot together uh, by regionally, as Tim would say yesterday. And what I really want to talk about is, well, why is hill farming important and why is it marginal and what can we do to turn that concept on its head? I think the most important thing to remember is that hill farming is a cultural landscape. There are very few natural landscapes left in the UK and in the British Isles. And so we have a cultural landscape. And for hill farming, it's made up basically of two types of assets, as I like to call them. There's tangible assets, the physical manifestations created by the farming process. So it's things like buildings, structures, sites and locations, product, and for many people, habitat is important. And I'll come back to that point. There are also many intangible assets in a cultural landscape that hill farming produces, ideas, practices, beliefs, traditions and values and sense of place. And these two come together to produce food. And whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan or a meat eater, it doesn't really matter. Food is essential for a large percentage of the population. Uh, lots of people still eat meat. And therefore, in relation to hill farming, the main product is meat and it is food. But food is a product, and at the same time, we produce this range of tangible assets. And it's about food production. It's about all the ad additional stuff we get from hill farming systems. The problem has been is that there are many, many challenges to hill and upland farming. The first thing is, is that we all know it's a multifunctional landscape. There are lots of different stakeholders and uh, interested parties who are all trying to see um, 
different uses from the landscape and that causes conflict of interest. Secondly, there's something called cognitive conflict. And this is related to all that multifunctionalism is that different players come onto the board, come into the hill landscape, and they have different points of view, different objectives about what they want to do with the landscape. And that creates tension. And we're all very familiar with the, the tensions between farming and conservation or conservation and recreation or water management and recreation. And it is an important thing to remember is that when you're trying to navigate through um, an upland environment, there are going to be different people with different points of view. And it's trying to bring everybody to the table to get consensus. And I think that's one of the messages for today is to try and bring everybody around to get consensus. And that consensus might mean that everybody has to compromise and there is no one objective that becomes priority over others. There are also issues of silo management, different organisations working in isolation, um, and that sends confusion signals out on the ground to those farmers and land managers who are trying to operate within this environment. And we have complicated land ownership patterns, and that land ownership doesn't actually fit the physical environment. And for upland and hill farming systems in particular, this can be an issue for the hefting system. There are more challenges that hill and upland farmers face. There are massive property rights issues in relation to access or mineral rights. Um, and so that causes issues for them. There is also um, centralised power and control. And again, this is something that Tim touched on yesterday. Too much telling rather than collaborating. Um, at the same time, we're now getting an increase of shareholders rather than land managers interfering in the process. And therefore, other people have other stakeholders have other agendas. It's more about the shareholder than the land manager. And there are issues there um, that are going on in relation to United Utilities in Cumbria and the RSPB. And then finally, we also have this challenge of the perception of marginality. And this is really what I would like to focus on today. And it's how we use language to describe a place and how that language perpetuates uh, a concept of places in your head. And I'm sure you'll recognise this gentleman, George Monbiot, and his ideas and his words in relation to sheep wrecked hills and the damage that that does in people's minds for their businesses, for their self-worth, for their pride. But also it paints a one-sided picture that's not very subtle. It lacks complexity and it, it fails to actually understand what's really going on underneath in relation to upland and hill environments and the communities that live there. So the question is, is what, what do I mean by marginal? What does that actually mean? Where has that come from? And, and why has it become such a millstone around the hill farming and upland farming landscape? Um, well, quite a while ago now, we had an agricultural depression in the UK and hill farming itself lost out to much more flexible lowland farming systems. Um, lowland farming had to react to drops in income so consequently, they, they switched to livestock production and they were able to easily outcompete the hill, for hill farmers who were still trying to produce the only thing they could, which was meat product. And therefore, hill farming suddenly became, rather than having comparative advantage, it suddenly lost that comparative advantage because the lowland farming systems were picking up the product that those hill farming systems has originally produced. So... What then happened is that as we came out of that agricultural depression, the, the hill farming community, the upland environments in the UK were in a real mess. And the government recognised that there was an issue and that they needed to do something about it. And then what followed, and it's a bit mind blowing, 28 reports between 1957 and 2011 about the marginality of the uplands. And what do we do about it? What do we do about this hill farming problem that people constantly talked about? And I've just listed here some of the reports that have come out between 1957 and, and 2011 about the hill farming problem and what do we do with marginal areas? And you can see that the use of language plays very strongly throughout all these various um, reports that were published. The Zuckerman report that looked at marginal land, forestry and agriculture. Uh, Sinclair wrote a report um, about Exmoor, about can it survive? The glorious less favoured areas, the disadvantaged areas. All these words carry negative connotation in people's minds and they make them think twice about, well, why are we supporting hill farming? Why are we subsidising it? What's in it for us? What's in it for the public purse? 
task force for the hills, farming's retreat from the hills, SAC, and eventually in 2011, the replacement of the LFAs by areas of natural constraint. Using words like this creates an image in people's head. So the question is, is why, why is hill farming perceived as marginal? Why is all this terminology thrown about? What is it? And really it comes down to what we call the physical and economic margins of cultivation. And the physical margins, as you can see, are driven by um, plant and animal physiological needs. And the uplands and the hill areas sit within the environmental extremes. So instead of being the most optimum condition for plant or animal uh, growth, it's either too wet, too cold, too dry or hot, too hot. Fortuitously, currently, we're not too dry or too hot, although I will say in Cumbria this year and the year before, we've had some terrible droughts which have started to impact on grazing and how people graze. But the, the bulk of the issue is, is that the uplands and the hill farming areas are perceived as too wet and too cold, and therefore you're limited in what you can actually do in relation to your productivity and your enterprises. And so many upland and hill areas focus on beef, beef, sheep, dairy and cattle and sheep, I beg your pardon. The other side of the coin is why the uplands are perceived as marginal is because they're economically marginal as, well, marginal as well. And quite simply, the result of the physical marginality means that you end up with an economic marginality crisis where costs of production can exceed prices that are achieved at market. So you're pumping so much into your farm system in order to get a profit margin that by the time you go to market, if there's a problem with the market and prices dip or it's flooded by cheap meat from somewhere else, then you're in a position where you've spent more money putting the livestock into the market system rather than the money that you receive when you sell. And this is one of the reasons why the government intervened back in uh, 1942 and then onwards from there in relation to upland areas, the subsidy system, um, the deficiency payments, and then in 1972 when we switched to the European Union and then the whole game began again with the support of subsidies and so on and so forth. And we all know the history of, of what's happened and I'm not going to go back over that um, because we all know we are where we are. So there is also, in relation to that marginality within upland areas, there are all sorts of other underlying issues that don't actually help in relation to the marginality debate. We know that uplands are remote from the main centres of population, which means that cost of transport is more expensive when you're moving goods around. We know that we have low population density in many of our upland areas. This is a classic example, just showing that you can see quite simply all our upland areas in the north and the west have low population density, so you don't have a massive workforce. We have a poor infrastructure. I thought this picture was quite apposite um, not about three weeks ago. Ambleside, where I work, became an island yet again. We've become an island usually two or three times a year. The lakes flood um, onto the roads and you just become completely cut off. Um, there are non-existent services like this poor old um, bus stop here that's almost redundant and no longer used. There are limited employment opportunities. Uh, I'm sorry this hasn't got much information about Wales on it, um, but it makes the point that basically we're looking at farming and tourism and that the need to actually diversify the economy in rural areas is absolutely critical. And all these added to the issues in relation to farming, the economic and physical marginality, they all add to that perception of marginality and people seeing the uplands as a place in need of support and lagging and not very helpful and, and not being productive and so on and so forth. So the question is, is why is this marginality there? Whose marginality actually is this? And I think this is the nub of it. Prior to the agricultural depression, marginality was simply not an issue. It wasn't in people's psyche, they didn't think about it, because the upland farming system sat within the thresholds of the environment. The idea of the shealing system in Scotland or Havel and Hendry in Wales, um, the, the whole system was focused on what the environment would produce at different times of year, and that's why the livestock were moved around. It was simply fitting in with the physical environment, 
from the uplands in the summer to the lowlands in winter, to the lower areas in winter, so that you would fit in with the fodder production, the availability of the resources that you need. And so before the agricultural depression, nobody really thought about it because the system, the upland farming system that existed fitted with the environment. What then happened is after the agricultural depression is that people began to say, oh, it's calamitous. We've had an agricultural depression. The uplands have really suffered. What is the hill farming problem in the uplands? Why is it occurring? And I think this quote by um, Angus Winchester from Joan Thurst's book from 1987, I think says it all really. Upland areas seen as deficient in terms of lowland norms. That whole idea that they're comparing one thing with another, I would argue they're comparing apples with oranges, concentrating on what they lacked, the uplands, rather than on their central activity, which is the breeding and rearing of animals. What is more, this view has tended to reinforce this assumption that grain growing was the main determinant of wealth, and thus such marginal lands were necessarily poor. And I really do believe that that view has continued right into the 21st century. And it's underpinning the issues that we now grapple with when we talk about how do we support farmers going forward? How do we encourage them to move from the current agenda to the new agendas? It underpins people's attitudes. And that attitude comes across in public perception, public uh, accountability, and so on and so forth. So we continue to compare the uplands to contemporary lowland production. So we see lowlands as, as the great places, the grain baskets of, of the UK. And therefore, there have been loads of reports, as I showed you. There's lots of policy decisions in relation to how we support and subsidise. Even the word subsidise has negativity attached to it and how all these grants are structured and, and put forward. The question I would, well, the point I would raise is that we've been doing this for 70 years in relation to agricultural and rural policy. And my question would be to you is, well, why hasn't it worked? We've done this for 70 years. We've looked at trying to bring uplands to the same norm as the lowlands, and it simply doesn't work. We're still in a mess. We still haven't really helped the hill farming communities move forward and engage with the right sorts of agendas that allow them to, to continue their businesses, to support the rural economy, to allow rural communities to continue. We're still making the same mistakes. So that sounds horrendous, and it is, and we just haven't dealt with the uplands and the hill farming areas at all properly. The question you have to ask is, well, why is that? What are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? So what I'd like to do in the second half of this talk is, is to change direction and start thinking about what is it that upland farm landscapes do actually have to offer, rather than this continual beating them with a stick about, well, you're in a subsidised area, you're marginal, you're hopeless, and so on and so forth. You need to innovate, you need to throw loads of technology at it like many um, grant things are now being proposed, let's get agricultural technology, let's do this. Everything in its right place and everything in moderation. The issue is, is that many upland farm landscapes, there are technologies you can use, but not to the same degree that you can in lowlands. And therefore you need to be understanding the underpinning about what upland farm landscapes are really about. So the first thing is, is we all must, must remember is that any farm is the first link in the UK food chain. And there are lots of discussions yesterday about food chains and the importance of community food funds and all the rest of it. And so we still need food. We have to produce food in this country. Tim talked about food security and food defence. These are critical. We cannot rely on sucking food from other countries, particularly when we have a holier than thou attitude and say, oh, we don't like deforestation and we need to save biodiversity loss in other places and in our own backyard. But if we're taking food and people are, and we're buying food, people are gonna to continue to produce food so from other countries. So you can't blame them for chopping down their rainforest when they can see a ready market in the UK. So it's important that we remember that we still need to produce as much of our own food base as possible, but it's how we do it that's important. Secondly, we know, and again, this, this is, obviously raised its head many times in relation to conversations about COP26 on the news feeds at the moment and BBC and so on and so forth. We know that 
meat and dairy systems in uplands are lowest, one of the lowest intensity and carbon producing systems that exist. The trouble is, is the whole thing is muddled up together. And instead of separating it out into the different types of meat producing systems that exist, they're lumped all together. And we're lumped in with massive grain feeding systems that you get in places like Argentina and so on and so forth. So we need to be more subtle in our approach about how we demonstrate the importance of upland and hill farming systems and that they can actually address some of these issues because they are some of the lower intensity ways of, of producing food and producing less carbon. I'm not saying that they, it doesn't produce carbon because it does and that does need addressing, but it's everything in proportion, it's all relative. And instead of beating farmers constantly with a stick saying you're very bad for the environment, actually, they're very bad for the environment, you could argue, in the context of what people are thinking about in relation to where we get our carbon from in the UK. But if you think globally, we're not as bad as everybody makes us out to be. Thirdly, and this is, I think, one of the most important things, is that um, upland farming systems create and maintain over 44% of our semi-natural habitats in the UK. There's plenty of evidence for this. Upland hill farming systems, they're a cultural landscape, they produce habitat, which then people appreciate, and we go through the process of protecting. I'm not saying that all farmers are good, I'm not saying that there are parts of the country where there has been overgrazing, but you can have undergrazing as well, and undergrazing can be just as damaging as overgrazing. And it's that recognition that if we didn't have our hill farming systems, we would lose a great deal of semi-natural habitat because we need the grazing in order to produce those habitats. Excuse me. We need to remember also that 53% of the UK total agricultural area is represented by the uplands and it's 26% of, of our total land area. So we have to address it because it is such a big chunk of our country. We need to to understand, and we all know this, that uplands are recognised as high nature value landscapes in many reports. There are hundreds and hundreds of things that say uplands are great. You could look at the materials from, from Europe or from other parts of the world. Uplands are seen as very resource rich in relation to biodiversity, nature value and so on and so forth. And there's a, a little thing there that I would just as an aside say is that it's really important that we understand and appreciate that, that if we don't have farmers producing these high natural landscapes, then we lose many of the other things that we would actually like in the uplands. And there's a re recent example that's come up in Cumbria where a group of commoners on a common had a, a high level stewardship scheme agreement that has, is just coming to an end. And Natural England tried to renegotiate the contract with them and they said, we'll extend it for a few more years until we go through agricultural transition. And the farmer said, OK, what would you like us to do? And they came, the natural England came back and said, we'd like you to reduce your stocking densities even further. And the farmer said, well, if we do that, we can't actually function anymore as a farm business. And they said, well, that's the deal that's on the table. And as a result, that group of farmers have now pulled out of their higher level stewardship agreement. And I think the, the moral there is that if you push people too hard, they will take their ball home. And if they take their ball home, everyone has lost. And that's the importance of negotiation and compromise. So this group of farmers have now actually scrapped their high level stewardship agreement. And as a result, Natural England have then lost all the good that they've gained over the last 10 years, because those farmers will now look at their farming system and decide how they're going to manage their businesses and possibly increase the stocking density again in order to allow their business to function to offset them, obviously the money they've lost from not being in the stewardship agreement anymore. Nobody wins in that situation. So it's how we approach moving people and farmers from point A to point B and how you do it without beating them over the head with a stick or bullying them into doing things they don't want to do. Because at the end of the day, people will walk. We also know that upland farming systems produce a huge range of public goods beyond farming. We know about flood management, peat stores, these are where the main peat areas, soil stabilisation, leisure, which underpins the tourist industry, health and wellbeing, getting people out into the countryside became really important over the last 18 months of the pandemic. So we know that there's lots of extra stuff that those landscapes produce, but part of it is it's part of farming and it's the integration of those different things that are important and it's managing that whole basket of things together 
in an appropriate way that allows farming businesses to continue, which then support communities through multiplier effects, but also allowing us to benefit from all these extra things, all these extra public goods that we really, really want. And then finally, we know that farming communities underpin the social fabric of rural areas. And I was at a farmers meeting a couple of weeks ago and, and talking in the kitchen afterwards. The comment was, is that, well, people don't understand that if my farming business goes out of business, then actually there's a multiplier effect across all these other small businesses that are supporting me run my farm. And people have this impression, the farmer said, is that we get subsidies we get money it comes in the bps and we sit on a big pot of money and we're having a wonderful time and he said i don't do that he said all that money goes back out of my farm almost immediately i need people to fix my tractor and i people to to come and contract wool for me so all the money flows through the farm and out into the local economy and that local economy supports hundreds of different types of jobs in all sorts of different ways so if you take too much support away from upland and hill farmers if you're not just hurting the upland and hill farmers you're hurting the whole rural economy and the whole rural society and how that functions and we need to ask ourselves really carefully is that what we want is that what we really want is we want a rural area that has nobody living in it so having said all that all those positives what opportunities are there that perhaps the farming community could engage with and the policy makers and so on and so forth. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to look at different geographical scales. Being a geographer, I sort of do this. So I, I'm not going to apologize. And one of the things uh, when I traveled to Japan that I found which was really interesting was something called geographically important agricultural heritage systems. And it's an international system that the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization uh, developed in 2002. And what it does is it recognizes traditional agricultural systems that have high heritage value. Now, I think this is a really interesting concept because this is focused on farming systems. Um, they, the examples that I saw in Japan is that they give their own branding, so that allows them to sell products at a premium. And if you want something a bit closer to home, because obviously Japan's quite a long way away, um, in Portugal, Portugal, the Barroso area is actually uh, one of these GS systems. And what's interesting about both Japan and Portugal is that they're, they're considered developed countries. The FAO set this scheme up for developing countries to help marginal and traditional farming systems in some of the poorest nations actually value their heritage rather than encouraging them to industrialize their farming system to say hang on a minute the actual traditional systems that you do have are actually very high heritage value and have other ways of making income and creating farm resilience that don't don't require you to industrialize your farming systems and this is what the FAO tried to do and it's interesting that of all the GIS, GIS sites that exist, there are six in the developed world. And there's one in Portugal, there's two in Spain, and Japan has three. And the interesting thing is, is that they clock, these governments have clocked that this is actually a really useful way of supporting the heritage value of areas that are traditional farming systems, and they can see the benefit of doing it. And the way they do it is there are five main criteria when you fill in your application form food and livelihood security, agrobiodiversity, um, local and traditional knowledge systems, cultures, values and social organisations, landscapes and seascape features. And you basically demonstrate how your, your farming system ticks these boxes. You then use those to actually develop a, a system that allows um, dynamic conservation because it's important that the, the whole system operates properly because it is a socio-ecological system if, that's, if you want to know the posh words for it. And that then allows employment for future generations and for future generations to stay within the area. And it is successful and it does work. So that's an international example of where I think perhaps in relation to Uplands, we ought to be looking at this system to try and help look at how we use Uplands in relation to farming and other purposes in a more integrated way. Second example I'd like to use is at a national level, coming down the, the scale. Um, again, I'll use an example from Japan, which just blew my head away when I actually was it was explained to me. What's happened is the Japanese ministries have actually come together to use food as a central spoke in their rural development policy. So instead of having policies that are from 
the, the agriculture industry, uh, ministry and a separate one for the rural development industry and another one for the business ministry and so on and the forestry ministry and so on and so forth. They've all come together to use food because they see it as central to society and the importance of where they want to go in their rural areas. So they see that food provides all these different goods and services and therefore they need to support food production because they benefit in so many other ways in these multiplier effects. So what they did is in 2019, they brought a Rural Development Act out. And what it does is it allows the ministries to actually pull their resources together to actually operate joint grant schemes. And I think that's something that we've lost with the, the loss of Europe and, and leader. And I will say it, and my husband will be delighted that I've said leader because he used to be a leader manager. Um, I think we've lost that. We've tried to disaggregate down some of these things back into their component parts. And this has particularly happened in England where agriculture has been separated out from rural development. And I think that's the kiss of death. I really do. And other, where other countries are reversing the process and understanding that farming is central to the rural economy, the English government have lost the plot on this a bit and have tried to disaggregate it down. And I think they've disaggregated it down to try and make it more straightforward and simpler. But in doing so, they've actually lost the multiplier effects that you get by having a synergistic and interrelated grant system. And I think the example from Japan is very interesting because, again, it's about ministries working together. DCMS should be working with DEFRA. It's a big issue that we have in the Lake District in relation to our World Heritage Site. That They operate distinctly from each other. They don't operate together. And when you're trying to manage a World Heritage Site that's predicated on agro, agro pastoral systems, it's a bit pants. I'm delighted that Wales is a bit more um, illuminated, I forgot if that's the right word, and the Future Generations Wales document is really interesting in relation to this. It's edging into this direction where there's a pooling of resources and ideas to understand that you look at it, you look at the telescope from the other point of view. Instead of looking at the fringe topics, as we've got in this diagram, all the bubbles separately, they're actually beginning to, the Welsh Government begin to look at the inside out. And to me, that's really critical about allowing rural areas to survive, but thrive is more important. And farming plays a critical, pivotal role in doing that. Coming down again to the regional scale, farm woods, I think, are absolutely critical. They're ecological corridors. Post-Brexit, there should be more demand for local product. And we know that woodland carbon credit schemes are coming online. Good examples, making sure people do small farm wood surveys, looking at the different markets they have for product. There's some fantastic work by Code Cymru. Um, really would recommend it. I use it as much as I can when I'm advocating uh, hill farming systems in, in England or in Japan or wherever I happen to be. The issue is, is that in relation to farm woods, farmers have lost the skills. They, they haven't got the equipment. Um, they have lack of time because it's been so focused on trying to keep the farm going. So there's, there's things there that I think could be explored as well um, in relation to thinking about how we bring farm woods back online because we all know that ecological corridors are really important. We know networks are important. And it's not this block planting that Tim alluded to that's now beginning to occur in Wales where corporations are moving in on farms. It's creating a network. Networks are really important ecologically because they allow species to move and migrate. It allows mixing of populations genetically. Um, it allows animals and so on and so forth to move when something perhaps when there is some work that needs to be done and there are some trees felled, it allows the animals to move elsewhere and, and continue to function. So I think there's lots of benefit from looking more carefully at, at farm woods and the network and how we use the resources that come from farm woods and, and encourage more sort of, I would call, um, farm wood production systems that allow farmers to come together, to work together as teams rather than just individuals. Most farmers don't have the time or the skills so why not have peripatetic flying squads of, of foresters that go around? They have a network of farm woods that they work and then they work with the farmers to market the goods and so on and so forth. Coming down again to the valley scale, it's really important that we work together. This is something that I keep coming back to, this idea of consensus and compromise. Upland farming systems like farmers, they see farmers and commoners working together. They don't always agree. I know of some, <laughs> some commoners that have fallen out with each other. That's the reality of human nature. But at the end of the day, it is an integrated cooperative system. 
And what's happened recently in Cumbria, as I'm sure you know, in 2015, we had Storm Desmond and we had some horrific flooding. And a local farmer called Danny Teasdale in the Oldswater catchment, he got his digger out and he basically dug his village out from uh, the flooding that was going on. This is the, the settlement of Glen Ridding, bottom right. And uh, he then started to think about, well, you know, where's the water coming from? Why have we got such a problem? And then he began to work up some ideas to work with different agencies and link sustainable farming to conservation and flood management. And so what he's done is that it was, was originally just Danny, then he got some more farmers together with him. And now he's got the whole community, all different parts of the community working together as a CIC, a community interest company. And what they do is they look at sustainable farming methods. They look to increase the conservation value of farmland. And they also look to uh, improve flood management. And that what Danny does is he acts as an intermediary between the farming and the rural community and the agencies like the Environment Agency or Natural England. And that actually gives him more power. It's a bit like the old marketing boards and that ability to, to have that negotiating power. So instead of people being picked off individually, Danny acts as the, the, the CIC acts as the almost like the broker to get projects done and to get income coming in. And then that income is shared amongst whoever. And what they do is that the work is proposed and delivered by the community. So the community come together constantly, the farm community and the rural community together to say, OK, what do we need to do next? Where can we get the next chunk of money to do this or to do that? And the whole system is allowing them to control their water better and their flood management better, increase the conservation value of their farmland, allow increased profit from different revenue sources for the farming community. So it's a really interesting project. And I would recommend that people have a look at um the, the CIC website. And then going right down to the bottom, what about the farm scale? What do we do with that? Well, we all know that farms are a series of different assets. They're physical, financial assets, human, natural and social assets exist. So if you want it as a picture, if you like pictures, what I've tried to do here is, is to think about not just the classic things that farms have, but also think more broadly about the skill sets and the assets that farms and farming businesses actually have. And one of the things I'm very keen on and we push very hard in Cumbria is to make people think about the range of assets that they have in their community, uh, in, on their farm, and try and realise those assets in a more effective way. We know that those assets vary farm by farm and every farm is different. And this is something, again, which is often forgotten by schemes that uh, are imposed from a top-down approach is people constantly forget that every farm is different. And when you have this discussion with the powers that be, DEFRA or whoever, they say, well, we can't afford to have a one-to-one -one system of, of support. But actually, I think you can't afford not to have a one-to-one -one support because if you actually did that, you could spend the same amount of money, but actually tailor it to each farm's resources, each farm's skill set, each farm's resource and asset needs. And instead of spending money in a top down way, if you spent it in a bottom up way, you'd actually get a better response because then you could actually start creating your networks between one farm and the next. So one of the things that I always bang on about is I think it's really important that when you're looking at a farm that you look at the whole business assets beyond the familiar. And there's some really good tools that um, Oxfam Wales have pro produced in relation to the sustainable livelihoods approach, which is what this is based on. So it's looking more at the range of all members of the family and what they donate to the business, all the resources that the farm has, not just the traditional ones of buildings and the, the farm assets, but actually looking more broadly. And I think we're beginning to shift into this zone in relation to things like carbon management and, and uh, peat management and so on and so forth. But this tool looks at it from the business point of view rather than looking at it from the public goods imposed view of the powers that be. So I think what I would like to say in conclusion is that the upland hill farming environment is a, is a network. It's a jigsaw puzzle. And my fear is, is that as we start to lose things from the system, eventually what will happen is that we will lose what we'd really truly cherish in relation to our upland landscapes. So it's evident from this short presentation that, that independent, uh, interdependent synergies exist between our up and farming system, our ecolog ecological networks, and the people who live and work in rural communities. These activities are interrelated and self-supporting if they're treated equitably 
and I emphasize the word equitably. It's not about farmer bashing, it's about bringing the farming community with you. Upland and hill farming is a clear example of a socio-ecological system which exists like many other places on the planet where they're actually recognised and nurtured. And I don't think we, we pay due regard to our systems in this country. And because it's a system, we need to recognise that destabilising one part leads to the collapse of other pieces, even if people think they're trying to help and they're trying to help in the right way. Upland farming is not marginal. It's central to many of the goals which we now to which we now aspire. And it must form a central plank in addressing the recommendations expressed recently in the Das Gupta review when he says, our economics are embedded with nature, not external to it. And Tim, I really resonates with what Tim was saying yesterday. Flood prevention, prevention, carbon sequestration, leisure and tourism, health and well-being, food security and defences, to name but a few. But don't push too fast too quickly because then you get backlash and the farming community will disengage as they have done on Bampton Common. Previously poor decisions about how to support upland farming have done it no favours, not for the farmers nor for the public purse. We have an opportunity now to balance the multiple benefits our uplands provide by finding the sweet spot between food production, public goods provision and ecosystem services. We can thus ensure that livelihoods continue and we will all benefit the value of, from the value that Upland Hill Farming brings to us in Wales and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Lois. What a very thought-provoking, um, uh, but also, I think, a very sensible, common-sense approach that we need to take farmers with us. What are the businesses and industry sector would we not be working with the people who are actually on the ground at the chalk face at the... Uh, the sharp end of the uh, production system. Right, so just a, a very few questions. Um, there are, have been quite a lot of comments in the chat here, and I think we we'll, the chat is there for people to read later. I think there are a couple of points, I think, um, from Vicky, that I don't know whether Vicky and Phil, uh, there's a point from Vicky about soils and damaged ecosystems that perhaps Vicky would like to um, unmute and to ask a question and then perhaps we can go on to Phil to talk about the synergies between high nature value and um, the, the branding, the protected area schemes. Vicky, do you want to have uh, an opportunity to ask the question? So it was around the, so the starving of the soils in upland systems about thin starved soils, but also the perception of uh, upland ecosystems as being uh, poor in terms of biodiversity. Um, I don't know if you want to, Vicky, if you don't want to ask that yourself, perhaps, Lois, could you address that? Yeah, yeah I think um, Vicky's dropped off, sorry. Just, okay, yeah, uh, that's okay, I'll still answer it. Um, people forget that soils come in different thicknesses in the uplands. Um, there are lots of areas of the uplands where soils are actually very, very thin anyway, naturally, because they're lithosols or they're, they're lithomorphic soils. Um, yes, there's been damage to soil, but there's been also been damage in the lowlands. You know, you can't just apportion blame to one part of the system. We do need to manage our soils better. And it's something we've struggled with since the 1970s and the Strutt report came out in 1972. Um, we do need to manage our soils better. They are very important to the whole system. And it's just part of the package is making sure that we bring that fertility back and make sure that we make them resilient. So that would be my answer to the to the soils question. In relation to biodiversity, well, again, I would say relative to the lowlands, the uplands are pretty rich in comparison. I'm not saying they're perfect, but they have a bigger opportunity to reinstate ecological networks, core nature recovery areas, and so on and so forth. We're closer to the goal if we use the uplands in a more effective way. But you can't do that by wiping out farming because farming is actually producing nearly 50% of it anyway through the actual systems. We wouldn't have hay meadows if it wasn't for farming. It's as simple as that. Mm. And perception about peat, peatlands being poor, biodiversity and heathlands being poor, which is certainly not the case. Well, there are different, there are different, different types, types of, of biodiversity. Yes. There are different types of peatlands. So like, you know, an, an oligotrophic trophic peatland where it's acidic you only have 20 plants because that's the community, but you have hundreds of really important insects and spiders and all sorts of stuff that you don't get anywhere else. So it is, again, it's the subtleties and the details of it. Whereas if you have a look at um, alkaline peatland areas, the biodiversity is massive. You can have up to 120 plants, plants a square meter. So, you know, and it, it is managing that process. 
Uh, I, is that just a very, very quick question? I mean, I've got a lot of questions, but perhaps we can answer and have a discussion outside this. If people are want, wanting to follow this up, then emailing Lois at Cumbria would be uh, the best way forward. Uh, I've just Phil's question about the synergies uh, between high nature value um, and uh, this type of branding. And I think we're going to have to then draw the session to a close if you can make that a very quick response to Phil. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he means by branding because I can't see the question for you. Well, it's, it's the links between the geographical designations that that you've been just talking about and how can that be broadened out to all high nature value areas, particularly well, areas well, that have national tags? Yeah, we don't bags. have to have a, a geographically distinct area. We could broaden it out and use it as a branding product. And, and it is more about higher quality, less quantity, but higher quality. So we all know what we're eating. We all know where it comes from. And different areas of the country actually benefit from this, their agricultural specialisms. I suppose that's what we're going back to is what in the old days was called regional geography. But that regionalism, I think, is important. And we actually start to try and think about how we do that and how we brand things appropriately to the different parts of the country. Yeah. And if you add in the environmental accreditation of carbon and water. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. That's really what people want to see. So why not put it on the packaging? Yeah. Right. Well, I think we're going to have to draw that to a close. So thank you very much for... Uh, to Lois for for talk and for also the the chat discussion that's been going on alongside. Um, I think it's a very good start to our second day, which is focusing on 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 farming and different aspects of farming um, GMOs and their uh, environmental credentials or otherwise, um, and the importance of livestock as well within an integrated farming system. Will be what's coming at us um, after coffee. Mm -hmm.